In the previous couple of videos, we have developed the instruction ROM module, which reads an instruction and feeds it into the decode module. The decode module then breaks down the instruction into its components. The timing of all this is currently being driven by the test module uh, using an Arduino program. In this video, we'll design a clock circuit that will drive the timing of the CPU, removing one more dependency on the Arduino. The main component that we'll use to set the timing of our clock circuit is a capacitor. A capacitor is constructed from two metal plates separated by a dielectric. If we place a voltage across the plates, a charge will build up over time, and we can do that by simply connecting one of the terminals to ground and the other to a voltage source via a resistor. The capacitor will charge up with positive charge on the plate connected to the voltage source and negative charge on the plate connected to ground. If we plot the capacitor voltage over time, we can see that we get an exponential curve reaching up to 5 volts. The curve can be described by this exponential equation, which starts at 0 when time t is 0, and approaches 5 volts as t approaches infinity. Tor here is the time constant of the circuit, and it's dependent on the values of the resistor and capacitor. If we increase the resistor or capacitor values, the time constant will increase and the capacitor will take longer to charge up. If we decrease the resistor or capacitor values, the time constant will decrease and the capacitor will charge up faster. This is how we will control the period of our clock. Let's now look at what happens if we connect the positively charged terminal to ground. The capacitor will now discharge through the resistor to ground and the voltage will drop exponentially towards zero. If we want to use this circuit as a clock, we need to be able to charge and discharge the capacitor repeatedly. For now, let's just do this by adding a switch. And the switch will allow us to connect the capacitor to either 5 volts or to ground. If we flick the switch up, the capacitor will charge up to 5 volts as it did before, but this time the current will flow through the switch. And if we flick the switch down, the capacitor will again discharge to ground. Otherwise, the charging profile is exactly the same as what we had before. If we do this repeatedly, whenever the capacitor is almost fully charged or almost fully discharged, then we get a periodic signal that's starting to resemble a clock. Of course, to generate our clock signal, we don't want to have to manually flip a switch. Instead, we can pull the voltage up and down using transistors. In this configuration, when we apply zero volts to the gates of both transistors, the PFET on the top will turn on, connecting the capacitor to five volts and the NFET on the bottom will turn off, disconnecting the capacitor from ground. If we apply 5 volts to both gates, the opposite will happen. And so we have the same behaviour as the switch, but now voltage controlled. If we look at the voltage across the capacitor, we can see that it oscillates between 0 and 5 volts. It's not a perfect square wave, but we're getting close. What we need is some way to trigger a 5 volt input to the transistors when the capacitor voltage passes above a certain threshold and then trigger a 0 volt input when the capacitor voltage drops below another threshold. Uh, for example, something like this. Note that the square wave here is inverted compared to the capacitor voltage. This will be important later on. The component we can use to achieve this is called a Schmidt trigger. The Schmidt trigger I'm going to use is the 74LVC1G14. Now this is actually an inverting Schmidt trigger, and the reason we need this relates to the observation that we made earlier. That is, the signal that we need to activate the appropriate transistor is always inverted compared to the capacitor voltage. If we scroll down to the logic symbol, we can see a representation of what's called hysteresis. And this is where the magic of the Schmidt trigger lies. Hysteresis basically means that the Schmidt trigger has a memory of sorts. When we have a change in the input, the output will only transition after the input crosses a certain threshold. And this threshold is different depending on whether we're going from a low voltage to a higher voltage or from a high voltage to a lower voltage. And that's exactly what the Schmidt trigger hysteresis symbol is showing us. And importantly for us, the output is only ever high or low, giving us the clean output that we're looking for. And for this Schmidt trigger, uh, which happens to be a Texas Instruments one, I'm not actually sure what make mine is. Uh, I bought it from AliExpress with very little details. So I'm not sure if it's a Texas Instruments 
chip or something else, but from testing its voltages seem to line up with this one. And we can see that the threshold voltage when we're operating at about 5 volts lies at about 3 volts when we're going from low to high. So our positive going threshold voltage is about 3 volts. And our negative going threshold is about 2 volts. The output of the Schmidt trigger is connected to the gates of the two transistors. And so it is now controlling the switching. We can see that when the capacitor voltage reaches the upper threshold, the output switch is high, turning on the bottom transistor, and the capacitor discharges. When the capacitor voltage reaches the lower threshold, the output switch is low, turning on the top transistor, and the capacitor charges up again. We finally have our nice clean clock signal, and we can precisely calculate the frequency of the clock using the time constant of the RC circuit and the upper and lower threshold voltages of the Schmidt trigger. If you've ever studied digital logic, you might have noticed that the two transistors actually form an inverter, or a knock gate. So we can combine the transistors with the Schmidt trigger. In other words, we can use an inverting Schmidt trigger. And there we have it, a complete RC clock circuit using an inverting Schmidt trigger, also known as a relaxation oscillator. And here we have the circuit implemented on a PCB. Now you'll notice that there are a bunch of other things on here. Uh, this is a general control module for the CPU, and it will generate the control signals to activate the parts of the CPU according to the current instruction. We'll come back to this in a future video and see how all these parts work, but for now let's just focus on the clock circuit. We have our clock with a Schmidt trigger and the RC circuit, and then the output is being fed into a prescaler, specifically the 74LS393. You can see that it's just a dual 4-bit counter. And if we have a look at the logic diagram here, you can see that each counter has an independent clock. So we can feed the most significant bit, which runs at 1 16th of the base clock frequency, from one counter into the clock of the other. And this gives our base frequency divided by 256. So we get a whole range of different frequencies that we can select from. We'll use the clock signal from the relaxation oscillator as its base clock and then each bit of the counter will provide a different frequency. But what is our base frequency? We can calculate the frequency of the oscillator by finding the charging and discharging times of the capacitor. This is the charging equation that we looked at before. However, in our case, the capacitor is not charging from zero, but from the lower threshold voltage of the Schmidt trigger. So we need to modify the equation a little. You can see that at time zero, the capacitor voltage is just the lower threshold voltage. And if we let the time go to infinity, the voltage will approach the supply voltage of 5 volts. Now, we want to know at what time the voltage will reach the upper threshold voltage, or the low to high threshold voltage. So we'll equate this to that and then solve. So we'll rearrange to get the exponent out by itself. Take the log of both sides. Shift Tor over to the left. And then we have our equation for T. If we substitute in the values that we have from the data sheet now to our low to high and high to low thresholds, and also the value for Tor, uh, then we can find that T is 1.58 milliseconds. This is the rise time for the capacitor charging, which corresponds to the clock's low time. To calculate the full clock period, we also need to find the discharge time. We want to know how long it's going to take to discharge from the higher threshold down to the lower threshold. So let's set the voltage and solve for T again. So we rearrange, take the log of both sides again, shift Tor back over to the left, and once again we have an expression for T. Substituting in the high-low threshold and low-high threshold and Tor, we get this, and equating that gives us, once again, 1.58. Now the symmetry here is just because of the values that our Schmidt trigger happens to have. Different Schmidt triggers will have different rise and fall times. If we add these together, we get a period of 3.16 milliseconds, and from this we can calculate the frequency, and it works out to be about 316 hertz. Now the prescaler could divide the clock by up to 256, giving a minimum frequency of about 1.2 hertz. If I connect up the old oscilloscope to the oscillator output, then we can check if this theory matches reality. The grid is set to one millisecond, and we can see that the clock period is a little over three of these. 
which lines up with our theoretical calculation of 3.16 milliseconds. I can select which clock I want by using the jumper on these pins. The original 316 hertz clock is at the top, and then the clock divided by 256 is on the next selection. And yes, I somehow managed to get these labels wrong. So the label, so the one labeled as divide by two is actually divide by 256. One of these days I'll produce a PCB without making a stupid mistake, but uh, today was not that day. Anyway, the divide by 256 output looks to have slightly over one second for its period, and that's what I was aiming for, so that looks pretty good. And uh, we can check the other prescaler outputs. Uh, so that's divided by 128, so that's going to be close to 2 hertz, around 4 hertz, and so on. So they all seem to be working pretty well. Uh, now, down the bottom here, if I select the last jumper, then this is connected up to a button, and that way I can control the clock one tick at a time. When I press the button, I get a low signal, and then when I release the button, I get a rising edge. So that gives me quite a few options for running the CPU at different rates, and I'll be putting it to good use over the upcoming videos when I develop more of the control system and finally piecing the whole thing together.